In this video, I'm going to walk you through what's going on inside a 10x probe and why that is important for you. The better you understand what's going on inside the 10x probe and how it works, the more effective you can be at using it correctly and avoiding artifacts that can be generated with this probe. So here's the deal. It's designed to plug into a scope. So you have one end plugging in the scope, the other end, we call this the tip end, is what gets connected to the device center test. It's called a 10x probe, kind of as a misnomer. It's not multiplying the signal by 10, it's dividing the signal by 10. So it's really an attenuating probe. And here's how it works. It is designed to work with the scope with the 1 meg input impedance in the scope. And so here is what that diagram looks like. Here is the scope over here. It's a very fast voltmeter and in the input of the scope already is a 1 meg resistor. That's the internal structure of the scope. And then we have this coax cable that comes over to the tip of the probe. If we were to use this in a 1x configuration we would have something that looks like this. This is the coax cable connection directly into the 1 meg. The device under test over here we would connect the tip and the ground to the 10x probe. We would connect the the tip and the ground to the device center test and then we would have a connection that goes through the 1 meg and we see the 1 meg input impedance to the scope. And that's basically what a coax cable does. In order to give a 10 to 1 attenuation in the probe we add a component here. We add a resistor and now we've got a voltage divider. The resistor here plus the 1 meg over here in the scope and so what resistor would you need here? We need 9 meg ohms um, in order to provide a 10 to 1 attenuation. If that is all we did, we would have a fundamental problem. This is what the configuration looks like of the probe and the uh, connection into the scope. That's what this looks like in principle, but in practice we've left out an important component. Electrically, this system looks like something like this. We got the 9 meg of the resistance of the resistor that we add on the tip. The coax cable, the first order, looks like a capacitor. And depending on the length of this, this is maybe in the order of about 50 picofarads for this particular cable. And then into the scope, we have the 1 meg resistor that is literally built into the front of the amplifier of the scope. But we also have some input capacitance. And depending on the scope, this is something in the order of about 15 to 20 call it 20 picofarads of capacitance. That's the equivalent circuit model for the probe to first order. Now we see a fundamental problem. At DC everything is fine, no problems. But if we were to send a step edge in, what have we built here? With the R's and the C's, with the R's and the C's, what we've built is a low pass filter. And the frequency for that low pass filter, well, you know, you write this as an equivalent, you combine these in parallel, you get the equivalent resistance of these guys, which is roughly the 1 meg here. So this is about 70 puff, you know, this could be a little larger, it's called 100 puff. And so we basically have an RC filter. This is a low pass filter. And this is about 1 meg, and this is about 100 picofarads. That means that when we send in a fast pulse, as a voltage signal, the response is going to be a low pass filter, which is going to have some RC time constant to it. And the RC is going to be, let's see, the 1 meg, 10 to the 6 times 100 puff, or 10 to the minus 10 farads, and so that's 10 to the minus 4 seconds. That is 100 microseconds. And if that's the period, the, the pull frequency roughly is going to be 1 over that, and so the pole frequency is going to be about 10 kilohertz. That means if we wanted to see a frequency higher than about 10 kilohertz, well, the technical term for that situation is we're screwed. It won't get through. It's going to be filtered out. This is a worthless probe. That's why it's only at DC, or frequencies below 10 kilohertz, where this probe would work if it was designed this way. This is a fundamental problem in the attenuating probe because of the capacitance of the cable and the input capacitance of the scope itself. So what do we do about that? And here is the secret of what goes on inside the 10x probe. We have the 
9 meg resistor because we want it to be attenuating. We have the coax cable here. We have the 1 meg into the scope and we even have that roughly about 20 puff of capacitance inside the scope as well. But this is a low pass filter, right? What we want to do is add a high pass filter in parallel. So the low pass filter, we'll do a Bode plot now. So this is the transfer function, or the response versus frequency. As a low pass filter, here's what our 10x probe does. And we saw it starts cutting off at around the 10 kilohertz frequency. We want to add in parallel a high pass filter that will do something like this. And so the high pass will let through the high frequencies, the low pass will let through the low frequencies, and the composite response will be flatter. And the way we do that is really simple. We add a capacitor in, in shunt across that 9 meg resistor at the front. And this is on the order of about 10 picofarads. And now the combination of this 10 picofarad capacitor in series with the cable and the input impedance now represents a high pass filter. The problem is, you know, if, if, if we don't match the pole frequency for the high pass filter to the pole frequency of the low pass filter, then we could get something that looks either like this, so that we have poor frequency response in, in this region, or something that looks like this, and so we have poor high frequency response. We want something that is the Goldilocks solution, just right. And so we need to adjust the pole frequency of this high pass filter. And the way we do that is we add another capacitor here that we can vary. And as we vary that capacitor over here, we change the pole frequency. We shift it around and we want to balance it so that it matches, compensates for the low pass response. That's what's going on inside of our 10x probe. Here is the tip. So when we plug our 10x probe into the scope, what we're really doing is plug it in not just a low pass filter but also a high pass filter. Inside the tip is that series resistor, the 9 meg, and a shunt 10 puff capacitor that gives us the high frequency. And built into the base of the probe that plugs in the scope is this compensation capacitor. We're going to take a reference measurement of a nice, beautiful, wonderful square wave with nice sharp edges. So that's the step response. We're going to take that signal that's going to come off of, it's built into every single scope, has a compensation adjustment source, a nice uh, fast edge. Um, a square wave. We're going to measure that, we're going to look at it on the screen, and we're going to dynamically adjust this capacitor over here in order to give us a flat response, which means a nice step response. And that's the very first step that we're going to do when we use a 10x probe. So let's plug it in and let's take a look at doing that. Now the connection to make that um, adjustment of the capacitance, the compensation capacitance in a 10x probe. You'll find if you go look at your 10x probe, you'll see, oh, there's a little hole here with a little adjustment knob on the inside. And that's what we use the screwdriver to get in there and adjust. So when you plug your 10x probe in there, in your scope, you just want to make sure that that little hole with the screw adjust is available facing up so you can get your screwdriver in there. So let's take a look at what the signal looks like from the compensation source inside the scope. And now, you, very important, when you look at this, there's the long bar and it says underneath it, really hard to see, but it says that's the ground connection and this is the probe compensation connection. So the tip is going to connect to the probe compensation signal and the ground is going to connect to the large bar in the inside. Now let's take a look at our signal on the scope. Here's the signal on the scope and the very first thing you're going to do after you plug it in is you want to adjust the time base and the vertical scale so it's a nice looking signal and then of course you're going to adjust the trigger in order to trigger this so it's a nice stationary signal. And you can see it's not such a great looking square wave. Now I'm going to increase the gain just a little bit here and maybe I'll spread it out just a little bit so we can get a good view of that signal. It's not a very good looking square wave. Look, we have all of this overshoot here, so we have too much high frequency getting through. Now if I adjust the screw knob over here, 
We'll see what happens. Too much, well, that's even worse. We're getting too much high frequency. If I go the other way, we're getting too much low frequency, not enough high frequency. We want to adjust that pole frequency so it is just right. The Goldilocks solution, a nice sharp edge with a nice flat response. That is what a, a flat transfer function is going to look like. Square wave goes in, square wave comes out. That's why we have this source built into every scope so we can do that adjustment. So the very first thing you're going to want to do when you have a 10x probe is if you haven't used it before, you don't know who else has used it, you're going to want to measure the compensation source and you're going to want to adjust that local capacitor on the inside, that variable capacitor, in order to match the high and low pass response. After we have adjusted the compensation so we have a nice clean square wave um, appearing in the scope, the next thing we want to do is make sure we have the scope set for 10x because what we want to see on the front of the scope is the tip voltage displayed. How does the scope know that we have an attenuation in the probe? How does the scope know it's a 10x probe? On, on some, with some probes, we have to tell the scope manually. In some probes, it's automatic. On this particular probe, it's manual. There's nothing here on the probe tip that's going to tell the scope, hey, we've got a 10x probe plugged in. It thinks we just have a coax cable plugged in. And so we have to set the scope to tell it there's a 10x probe. And the way we do that is we either push the button here that opens up the menu items at the bottom for this probe, or you'll see over here under the summary screen, here's the channel one, this is in um, uh, yellow. We just touch the settings for the DC probe and we see here attenuation and we want to make that 10 to one. And now we can see here, yep, it's 10 to one. And now the scope knows I have 10x attenuation. It will automatically change the scale. That's all it's doing is changing the scale in order to multiply whatever I see coming in by 10, and now I'm displaying the tip voltage. And then, of course, the third thing I like to do when I use probes is color code the tips. Look, it's a yellow trace on the screen. It's a yellow band over here. And on the scope probe, look, it's a yellow band as well. And not only that, but when I connect a wire to the front of the probe and I'm doing a measurement, look, I use a yellow wire so that I can tell instantly, oh yeah, whatever that's connected to, that's the yellow trace on the scope screen. It just reduces the risk of confusion. Now we're ready to use the 10X probe for an application.